to be in the house of God today. Amen? Awesome. Awesome. You guys sound good. You guys look good. You guys are on fire today, man. I love it. I love what's in the atmosphere today, man. Uh, hey, so just by way of celebration, um, these last two Sundays, you guys, have been so amazing. Since we started this series in November, the beginning of November, the first week of November with Grateful, we've seen record-breaking Sundays two weeks in a row. So it's been like... And, and over the last two weeks, 195 salvations. Isn't that crazy? God is so, I was doing something here. And so before I get into this message, uh, part three of our uh, Grateful series, I wanted to put something on your radar that we're really excited about. We always get excited about it every year, and that's Christmas at Discovery, Sunday, December uh, 22nd. This is always a great experience for you. Your kids always do something really great and special. There's like carols and musical specials, candle lighting. There's always an inspirational message as well. I want to put on your radar six service times because they're different. Every service time is different than the normal service time with the exception of the 6 p.m. service. Hey, last, this last Easter, just you know, earlier this year, we saw over 1,900 people come to Discovery, and we actually had to turn away people uh, because it was just over overflowing. So the first service and the second service, this one here in particular, was overflowing. So I got I got an ask of you. If you're part of the family of Discovery, I got an ask of you. We not we want you to invite, we want you to bring people, but we also want to make room. Okay, so so there are some services, because these services are the prime. When someone visits a guest of Discovery, they're coming to the 930 or the 11. That's when they're gonna come, you guys. But those of us who are part of the family, can I encourage you? strongly encourage you to make some room and come to that 8 a.m. service, man. Wake up a little earlier or, or come to the 12.30, 4.30, or 6 p.m. because there's room in those services. Now, look, if you're bringing someone and you got family or you got coworkers or someone's coming along with you, come with them. If they don't want to go, oh, 8 a.m., I don't want to go, whatever. Come with them anyway to that, that middle service. But if you can, make some room for us. We're expecting over 22 to 2,400 people here at Discovery. So we'll talk to you more about that. Not only are we doing six services, but we're going to make some room in some other exciting ways. So, hey, uh, we're in this series, part three of Grateful, this Grateful series. And this is our theme verse, 1 Thessalonians. Take out your sermon notes if you got them, you guys. This is kind of where we're, we're, we're kind of the foundation of all these messages that we're bringing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So when we think of God's will, like God's will for our life, and what does he want for our life? What is God's will for our life? A lot of us get hung up right here in this word. You think about the circumstances of your life, don't you? When you think about God's will, it's like, what are your circumstances? Because God, I want to do this. I want to go here. I want to be that. You think circumstantially according to God's will, but what I want you to understand through this series and today is that God's will has more to do with what's going on inside of you than what's going on outside of you, okay? So let me say it this way. God's will for you, God is more concerned in what, what you can control than what you can't control. You see, we can, that, that we get hung up circ on the circumstances and we become up and down. We get lukewarm in our faith. We become in and out and hot and cold kind of thing. But, but because we're all, we all want the, this circumstance, we have this expectation. But God is going, look, no, no, what my will for you is in all circumstances for your faith to not be shaken. In all circumstances for you not to drift away. In all circumstances for you to guard your heart, to guard your attitude, to have this attitude of gratitude, to be grateful, to give thanks in all. Because there's going to be some circumstances that you're not going to like. That, that you're going to say, this doesn't look like your will. How do we do that? So we've been studying these, these different circumstances. How can we be grateful and choose to be grateful Part one was in the delays. How do we be grateful in the delays of life where, where it's not happening when we thought it would happen um, or even the way it would happen? Last week, we studied how to be grateful in the detours when, when you have to get off the exit of where you thought you were, you were heading. And whether it was some detours are bad, they're hurtful, they're harmful, but actually some detours, we, we talked about it, some detours, we thought they were good. They came disguised as good. It was a, it was a promotion. And some of you took, you took a detour of a promotion that took you out of the will of God. You, you, you followed the money instead of the voice of God. Okay, and so, it, and so detours don't have to be just bad things. It's not, it's, sometimes they come disguised as blessings and good things. So today, though, in part three, um, is 
the most challenging. Today is the most challenging um, to choose to be grateful in the darkness. How, how, how can I be grateful in that dark time? I'm talking about the crisis, the, the, the catastrophe, the, the tragedy, the valley of the shadow of death experience that we go through. How? How, how can we be grateful in those circumstances? And I want to ask you to do something for me. Um, everyone lean in for just a moment. I want to ask you, please, for the next 30 minutes, can you just not push back on me during this message? Because where I'm going to go today and some things I'm going to say, you're going to want to push back on. You're gonna, your mind is going to go, yeah, but wait a second, what if this and what if that? And, and, and before you start making excuses and building up walls, can I ask for you to let me take you on a journey to give you the full counsel of God's word? And then after, after this just 30 minutes of studying what God has to say about being grateful in our darkness and our dark periods in general, then you can make a, a, a decision at the end. But I don't want you to build up a wall that would prevent you from receiving what God wants you to receive today. So, hey, for the next 30 minutes, no pushback. Just let me take you on this journey and studying what God has to say about the darkness and how we can be grateful even in those dark periods that all of us are going to face and experience. And, and to, to teach this today, we're going to study Habakkuk. And Habakkuk, some of y'all don't know even what, who that, you thought that was a Hebrew cuss word or something like that, Habakkuk or something. <laughs> Habakkuk is a dude, he's a prophet. He's, it's, he's one of the books of the Old Testament. He's one of the 12 minor prophets. And um, he is a, a temple priest and even a musician. That's, that's his place. But give you a little context of Habakkuk. His story and his life takes place 600 years before Jesus. And it was in a time of, of Judah, Israel's um, life and, and, and experience that, that they, were, they used to be a powerhouse. They used to be prosperous, but now they're, they're impoverished. And they are, they, they walked away from God. They turned their back on him. So there is a lot of corruption and violence and injustice. And Habakkuk is looking at this and he's confused. And he's angry. And he's disappointed because he knows that God could do something. But he doesn't. And he's, and he's struggling with that. And he asks some really good questions. Let's study it. Habakkuk chapter 1. We're going to start there. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. He says, how long, Lord, must I call for help? I don't think you're listening, God. I don't know if you ever felt like that, right? I'm crying, but you're not listening to what I have to say or, I, or cry out to you. Violence. Do you not see the violence? But you don't come to the rescue. They're getting away with it. You didn't come to save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? The prophet doesn't get it. He, he knows that, co that God could intervene, but he doesn't. Habakkuk's name describes kind of who he is perfectly. Write his name down because this is, I want you to see this. Habakkuk means to wrestle or to embrace. I want you to write that down. We need to, we need to learn this, to wrestle and embrace. See, the, the true struggles of our life don't play out like we think. They, they don't play out like the sitcoms that you like to watch. You know, some of you watch the Brady Bunch and stuff. That ain't life, okay? You watch The Office or Parks and Rec. I don't know what you want, what you watch, but life struggles, real life struggles, are, don't go from happy problem and problem solved within 30 minutes, including commercial breaks. That's not the way life plays out for us. Life is a struggle. And there are dark times and seasons that we have to endure in our in our life, because how we, your life doesn't like like you you lose a job and then you you get a, another job and it's even a better job and it has even better benefits. Oh my gosh! And then you get the guy in the end too. Oh my god, that's not life. Because way life way life kind of happens a lot of times for people is they, they like their job but they lose their job and they don't find a better job, and then they have to file for bankruptcy because it didn't happen when they thought it would happen, and then they have to deal with these 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 feelings of. Failure, that, that's, that's sometimes the dark season that people have to endure. Maybe you loved your spouse and you thought they loved you. And they betrayed you. And they cheated on you. And then they, they, didn't, they didn't ask for any forgiveness. There was no remorse. They blamed you and left. It's dark times that we have to endure. You may, you may be liking life and loving your life the way it is, but then you get a bad medical report. And then, and then you go through chemo. And you pray. And you beat it, only for it to come back with a vengeance a few years later. Dad, I, 
And then and through all this, some well-meaning and well-intentioned Christians along the way, the Christian says, you know, God is in control. Let go and let God. And that's good and all, that's good. But, but how do I get from here to there? Because right here, my faith is rattled. Like if we were honest, this dark period, I'm spiritually shaken. I like, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not there yet. I, my faith has is, is been shaken because of this. I can't conceive and I, you know, I can't have a baby. And I see people, other people have babies. They don't even want the babies. And I can't. Why? Why? God, you could do something about this, but you don't do something. I'm faithful. I've been a faithful believer. I serve you. I go to church. You could deliver me from my migraines. You could deliver me from my depression or my anxiety or my panic attacks. But God, why? Why? So we're, there's a struggle. There's a struggle of a discrepancy of what we perceive God to do in his word or his will to what is really happening in our life or even around us. There's so much suffering, God, I don't understand. Starving babies. There's this disasters. There's, there's terrorists. There's school shootings this last week. God, what is going on in the situation? He asked some questions, man. Some really, he's struggling with, the, with what he's seen happening in the world around him. He's going, God, let, look, it, it continues in verse 3. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife all around me, and conflict is abounding all around me. This side saying this, this side saying that. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. Habakkuk had some problems with what he perceived, and maybe you can relate to some of these. Let me just kind of, this, this is what Habakkuk's struggle was. He said something like, you know, you don't seem to really care, God. I don't know if you can relate to that in any dark season of your life. You don't seem to really care. You're allowing injustice. There is suffering you're allowing God, or maybe you're, you aren't really doing much when you could. You could do. Aren't you God? Aren't you all powerful? There's nothing impossible with you, God. You could, but you're not. And then what you are doing doesn't even seem fair. It doesn't seem like God, because if I were you, God, I'd be doing things differently. Anyone ever felt like that? Anyone ever thought that? God, if I was you, I would do things differently than you. Let me ask you an important question to where we're going today, okay? Is it ever okay to question God? I want you to just feel that. Can you feel that with me for a moment? Because some of you have been taught one thing or the other. Is it ever okay? Because Habakkuk has some questions. He's, he's struggling with some things that he's perceiving. In a, is it ever okay? And I don't know what you've been taught. Maybe that, oh, no, you got to just, no, you got to just, that, that means you don't believe or you don't trust. I want you to know today that the answer is yes. Like, absolutely, it is, it is, it's, it's not the, it's how you question God. It's how you're questioning. See, because a third of the Psalms are written by people who are struggling with the despair and the difficulty of life. People that are hurting many books in the Bible, Job, Lamentations, um, Ecclesiastes, Jeremiah, all had confusion to the pain and suffering of faithful believers. Even Jesus asked the question, why why have you forsaken me, God? You see, what if acknowledging your doubts is the first step to a deeper faith? What if, what if embracing your secret questions actually opens the door to a deeper intimacy with God? So, so God responds to these concerns Habakkuk was expressing in, in verse 5. Look at the nations and watch, he says. Be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something. It looks like I'm not doing something. I'm telling you right now, Habakkuk, I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. He goes, Habakkuk is saying, I don't understand. And God is saying basically, just wait, I'm not finished. I'm not finished. I'm still working. And even if I tried to tell you what I was going to do, you wouldn't get it. You ain't on my level, bruh. You know what I mean? God's like, God's like you're not on my level. You can't understand. Even if I would try. And then, and then God tells him just a little bit, though. In verse 6, he, t he just tells him just a little bit what's happening next. <laughs> he, he says, and I'm raising up the Babylonians. The Babylonians was, you know, a, a people who worshiped false idols. They were just, uh, they, they invaded territories and destroyed lands and impoverished. They enslaved people. God says to Habakkuk, I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. 
They are a feared and dreaded people. They all come intent on violence. And Habakkuk goes, what? You do what? This, this ain't right. This is not fair. This does not sound fair at all, God. And see, Habakkuk, his name even means something that's a key for us to understand, to, to embrace and get to this place of gratitude in the middle of our darkness, you guys, because a committed believer can both wrestle with honest questions and embrace a genuine faith in God. A committed believer can embrace those things. They can wrestle with those honest and sincere questions and still embrace a genuine faith in God. You see, God understands your pain. And listen, God welcomes your questions. God would rather you yell at him than run away from him. Amen? Amen. Amen. God, God is okay with you venting to him. Here's how the, prophets, the prophet responds in verse 12. He says, Lord, are you not? From everlasting, my God, my Holy One, you'll never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to even look at evil. You can't tolerate wrongdoing, so I'm scratching my head here, God. Why then? I don't know, have you ever said that? Why then? Gosh. Why? Why did you take them when you did? Why? Why? Why, why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those who are more righteous than these? See, what I want you to see today in this dark place, don't, don't deny your doubts. Let your doubts drive you to God. If we want to have a deep and abiding faith that survives the darkness, we have to learn how to both wrestle and embrace. How to, how to wrestle with the questions and the concerns and the injustices and the inconsistencies that we perceive while embracing God. Not, not just grin and bear it. Not pretend like it's not there. Not fake it till you make it. Not, no, 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 no. Wrestle with that. Don't, don't just shove it down. Don't stuff it aside. Wrestle with that question before God. We have so many examples in the Bible of people who who wrestled, who struggled with God through some of these inconsistencies. We see Abraham wrestling with God's timing. We see Job wrestling with the financial collapse and even have to bury his own children. We see Jeremiah and Elijah and all these people, David wrestling with God. They're all throughout the Psalms struggling with the inconsistencies of what they perceive, bringing them to God. In fact, Jacob, <laughs> Jacob in Genesis 32 actually literally wrestled with God. Can you imagine that? Like struggled with him, contended with him. Look what it says about this. That, that, this was uh, in Genesis chapter 32. God actually came in this, in this angelic form to Jacob. And, and in the Bible, these are called, in the Old Testament, they're called theophanies. I don't have enough time to teach you the theology and stuff, but basically it's Jesus incarnated in angelic physical form in the Old Testament. Okay, so moving on. So this is so Jacob. I know, huh? I'm so sorry. We'll get we'll, one day. Okay, you go study that. But but Jacob wrestles with God, and he doesn't let him go. And God tells him, "Your name will no longer be Jacob, which means deceiver. Your name will be Israel, because you have re look at this. You've wrestled with God and with people. You actually wrestled. You struggled with me, and and that wasn't and and you have." One. It's not like he defeated God or he subdued God. He actually struggled in such a way that got him a blessing. See, some of you are struggling. It's not that you're, you're, look, some of you are struggling against the darkness instead of struggling with God in the darkness. And there's a big difference. There's a really big difference. See, you're fighting the actual trial. You're fighting those people. You're fighting the, the, the situation. You're fighting against your finances. You're fighting against the relationships instead of fighting with God, wrestling with God through your darkness. And there is a big difference in the outcome of those two things See, because God loves to wrestle those questions and concerns with you. He loves it. He loves when you engage him with your doubts and your concerns and, and, your, and, and what you perceive. So, so what are the steps that we can take in order to accomplish this? That every person in the Bible, all these people, these patriarchs, these faithful people that had to walk through darkness went through a similar pattern of how they struggled with God and wrestled in the darkness till they got to this place that they were able to be grateful. 
even in the darkness, even in the valley of the shadow of death, to wrestle in the dark until you arrive at gratitude. How do we do that? How do we, let me show you, write some notes here, you guys. The first step that we need to take to wrestle to gratitude, number one, is complain to God. Complain to God. See, God is big enough to handle your complaints. He got big, he's got big enough shoulders. You're not going to bruise his ego. He's not going to be mad at you. He's okay. He wants to hear the complaints. Vent to God. Stop complaining to people and start complaining to God. Look, and I know some of you, you don't want to. You feel like that's, that's unholy or ungodly. Listen, you're going to complain anyway. It's going to happen. It's gonna, you're just going to step it down and pretend and pretend and put on your religious happy face until your volcano erupts on somebody, and then you're going to just get after it erupts. You're going to start pushing down, pushing it down again, pushing it down again. Look, just complain to God. He can handle it and process it the way it needs to be processed. Stop complaining to people. Complain to God. And by the way, stop hanging around with people that complain, okay? Because those people will, will, are toxic to you, okay? You, you need to draw a line and stop getting around those people that are always complaining about God and complaining about life. No, listen, God is big enough. If you want to wrestle, if you want to struggle well, okay, with God, and get to this place where you're not hiding these things, but you're wrestling to a place of gratitude, we got we to gotta look that to, in order to have this deep and abiding faith. We have to wrestle and embrace, wrestle and embrace. So first we complain to God, and then we can do the step number two, which is to appeal to God's nature. Do you know who God is? Do you do know? You have, you have to appeal to his nature in the middle of your darkness because you, you, God is infinite. God is never changing. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. God is always everywhere. God is completely perfect. He's completely good, completely faithful, completely just. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is loving. God is good. Amen, somebody? And that's a struggle. Listen, that's a wrestle to get there when you're in your dark place, isn't it? It's a wrestle to get to that place, to declare the nature and the goodness of God when you're not experiencing it. After you vent to God and complain, you've got you to gotta start declaring the nature of of God, even in the middle, and I'm telling you what you're doing is you're bringing light into the midst of darkness. That light is expelling with every word, with every declaration, my God is, my God is, my God is. You're just bringing light to your dark place. And, and then when you, when you do that, when you do that, you can get to this third step, and that is to remember what God has done. And oh my goodness, listen, it's a wrestle to get here. To get to this step of the, of the wrestling, the struggling part in your darkness, it's, it's a struggle to get here, to actually, because because in the darkness, you can't see nothing but dark. You, you can't. It's dark. And it's easy to drift away. It's easy to become negative and cynical and, 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 and lose hope and lose faith, because all you see, it's the reality is this is a valley. The reality is this hurts. The reality is this sucks. The reality is it didn't come when I thought it would come. The reality is I buried my friend. The reality is darkness. That's the reality. But when you complain to God and set up the people, when you start declaring God's nature and bringing light to that thing, now in the middle of my dark place, I can remember the goodness of God because what he did. God has brought me. God has delivered me. He was faithful then. He'll be faithful again. You can start to remember what God has done when you follow this process, when you wrestle it through. Don't pretend it's not there. Wrestle with it. It's, I know it, it's not. It's okay. All of, us, all of us have dark times. It doesn't mean you're less holy. I don't, it is no less righteous because you got sick or someone died. No, that is, that is toxic religion, man. Wrestle with that question before God. Remember what he's done. And then here's the fourth step. After we do that, we remind God of what he said. Now, now, now I'm declaring the promises of God. And the Bible says that every promise for us now is yes and amen. Okay, his promises will not be, uh, or, will, or his, God's promises are not empty. They're not empty. You can declare those promises o o over your life. And see, when you only see in part, and that's why God is telling Habakkuk, man, I can't tell you what you wouldn't even understand it because you only see in part. In this world, you only see in part. And when you only see in part, you got to prophesy the promise. You prophesy the promises of God in in. A couple weeks, in the first Sunday of December, we're starting a new series. I'm going to help you with this. It's called Prophesy the Promise. And so when, when you're only seeing in part and what you're seeing, it doesn't seem to be part of the plan. 
What do you do? So how do you prophesy the promise over your fears and over your future and over your anxieties? How do we declare the promises of God? I'm going to show you what promises you need to declare in those times here in December. Look forward to that. But that's 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 a step of the struggle in the wrestling process. You know, when when you have the questions and the concerns and the doubts, we get to this place that we can not only remember what God has done, but we remind him of what he's yet to do. We start to speak faith. And we start to uh, speak uh, prophetically even, declaring the promises over our life and getting to this final place, this last step of expressing our total trust in God. Man, it's a, listen, it's a struggle to get here, but this is authentic faith. All right, this, is, this, is, this is a genuine faith that was born out of trial and fire and darkness, and walking, and enduring, and persevering. This is a genuine faith to walk through, struggle through, wrestle through with authenticity, and get to a place where you say, God, I put my trust in you. Even in the darkness, you are God. Look at Habakkuk now in chapter 3. We're written, Habakkuk starts in chapter 1, and he's not, he's, he's not happy about what he's seen. But in chapter 3, someone say chapter 3. See, some of you give up in chapter 1. See, your chapter 1 doesn't look good, doesn't feel good. It's really dark. And, 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 and because you didn't struggle well with those doubts and those questions and those concerns, you didn't wrestle it through. Man, the enemy took you out in chapter 1. You stopped going to church. You stopped serving. You stopped this. You stopped that. You turned your back on this. And, and look, I don't know about you. Say chapter 3 one more time. Come on. I'm getting to chapter 3. I'm not going to give up in chapter 1. I'm not going to quit in chapter 1. I'm, I'm going to persevere. I'm going to struggle through. I'm going to wrestle with the darkness until I get to a place where I can express my total authentic faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? This is, this is chapter 3, Habakkuk now, okay? Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. And then he says, though, the fig tree doesn't bud, and there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Let me put it in today's context. Though I don't get the job before the holidays. Though I can't give them the Christmas I want. Though the healing doesn't come. Though I have to bury another family member. Though, you fill in the blank, though, yet I will rejoice. In the middle of my darkness, in the middle, the, even though, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be, look at this, joyful in my calamity, in my crisis, in, in, in the darkness and in despair, I will rejoice. I struggled with this. I didn't hide it. I didn't push it down or push it away. I wrestled with it with God. And I got to this place where I can say, though, it doesn't happen. I'm going to rejoice. And I will be joyful in God, my Savior. So what do we do here? How do we get to this place of wrestling the darkness to gratitude? It, it's how you wrestle is key. So let me give you this, this, this thought here. In um, Your wrestling, go ahead, your wrestling will lead to a blessing if it ends with embracing. See, some of you are wrestling against some things, but the way that you're wrestling needs to change. The way that you're struggling with that question and that doubt and that concern, it's like you're trying to convince God to do what you want him to do instead of trying to seek the understanding of an almighty, all-loving, all-just, all-good God. When you struggle and you wrestle while embracing God, it's going to lead, like it did to Jacob, it'll lead to a blessing of your life. So, so how do we do this? How do we embrace God in the dark? Not just struggle. Don't just struggle with it. But how do we wrestle and embrace? Say wrestle. wrestle. Say embrace. embrace. How do we, okay, how do we wrestle and embrace? This, let me show you how to embrace now. This is Habakkuk chapter 2. How do we get to Habakkuk chapter 3? Okay, this is how you embrace while you're wrestling. Number one, listen. Hey, lean into God and listen. Don't run. 
don't quit. Lean in and listen. God wants to speak to you. It is, his silence does not mean he is absent. It's just God is often speaking at a decibel that requires your full attention. Which oftentimes, you know what, the darkness, those dark periods of our lives are sometimes blessings in disguises because I don't have the distraction and the noise and the toys and the things in my life. All I have to do and all that, I got to lean in and listen. Sometimes God's voice is the clearest in our most, most darkest times, isn't it? If we just lean in and listen, Habakkuk chapter 2 now, verse 1, Habakkuk says, okay, I'm going to. I'm going to stand at my watch and station myself. Do you have a station where you wait on, where you, where you lean into God? Do you have a room? Do you have a chair? Do you have a place that you go to? And you, maybe in your dark season or not, man, but a place you go to where you're leaning in and listening to the voice of God. He said, I'm going to station myself in the ramparts. I will look to see what God will say to me. See, it's not, it's not easy to do this. Like, it's not easy in general just to get to a place where we can listen and de declutter and stuff to God. But when we're hurting, this is even more difficult to listen because we don't want to listen when we're hurting, when we're in pain. We don't want to listen. We don't want to hear what God has to say. We want to tell God what he ought to do. Okay, God, this is what I need you to do. We don't, we're really not very open in the middle of pain, but God, God is speaking. Hey, can I tell you something, though? You may not like what he has to say all the time. Because sometimes, he, he, sometimes God is saying, I'm sending the Babylonians. What do you do? What, what, how do you embrace? How, how do you get to this place of, of, of total trust in God when he says, I'm not going to remove that thorn? See, Paul, Paul in the, in the New Testament, he, he had this thorn in his flesh he described. He didn't tell us what it was, and I like that because every one of us can relate to some type of thorn in our flesh, a weakness, a, a, a part of our life that we wish would just go away, a part of our life or our character or our or, or physical or health or something. You say, God, I know you could, but will you? The Bible says that, that the Apostle Paul prayed three times, like, God, kill me. I know you can. Please take this infirmity, this storm, whatever it is. Take it from from me and God tells him my grace is sufficient for you I'm going to leave that thorn there so it can remind you that my grace is sufficient see sometimes you won't like what he has to say and that's where the wrestling starts and that's where you where you have to bring that before God and struggle that through and remind God and remember and declare and express your total trust Paul had to do that, I'm sure, over and over. This was a dude who was like beaten, shipwrecked, left for dead, snake bitten. I'm sure he had to, he was, he, he did. And actually, Romans chapter 7, he processed openly for us. He says, my goodness, I want to do the things that I, that, I, that I should do, but I continue not do the things that I want to do and I want to obey, but I don't. God, what a wretched man am I. And, and he struggled. He struggled with God, though, not struggled in isolation and in stag. Nation. So that's the first step. If you want to embrace, embrace God in the wrestling, lean in, lean in and listen. And then here's step two that Habakkuk does. And that is write it down. Write. Write. What you're doing like right now, hopefully you're writing Habakkuk chapter two, verse two says this. So, so, so Habakkuk, he, he leans in. He says, I don't like what I'm hearing. I don't like what I'm seeing. It's dark. It's not good. But I'm, I'm going to get to my spot. I'm going to get to my place. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to declutter it, all the noise. And I'm going to lean into your voice. And I'm going to listen. And, 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 and then it says that God's, it, God spoke to him there in his quiet place. And when you speak, God, I'm listening. And I'm going to write that revelation down. The Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. Um, write it down. That, that's why we do sermon notes here so that you can write down the revelation of God's word and not just the feelings and some of them the feelings are your word and what God is speaking to you right now but oftentimes it's the stuff you write off on the side isn't it it's the stuff that that sometimes I see pictures of you guys posting it's like all these notes everywhere I'm like looking at the indent like who said that I didn't say that how'd they get that point that's good that's going in the next sermon I don't know where they got that point but that's a good point right there because God is speaking to us He's given us rhema. He's given us voices. We lean in and we listen. And he says, write that down because the enemy wants to steal whatever God gives you. Okay, the, listen, the enemy doesn't care about the stuff you have on earth, the earthly things, earthly pleasures, the things that will fade away and decay and burn up or rust. He doesn't care about that stuff. The enemy, the thief, the Bible says, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And what he wants to 
fee from you is everything that God has given you. That's what he wants to rob from you. Some of you are like, oh man, he's taking, like, like the, these physical things. That's not really where the enemy's attacking you. The enemy's attacking you in the revelation. That's where he wants, to, he wants to rob you of the seed, the Bible says, of the word of God. And so you write it down so that you can come back to that. You write it so you can remember it and you can own it. And you can come back to that in your dark place and you can say, oh, I remember what God said to me. And it gives you life and it gives you hope and it reminds you of the rhema that God promised you. It was a you promise, okay? It, 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 you might have a journal or something that you need. You might have the, like I use my, my notes app on my phone on my iPhone. For those that don't have an iPhone, we're going to have an altar call later, and we'll pray for you and, you know, help you come to Jesus. But for those of you that are saved, the, the notes, I'm just kidding, the notes on the, <laughs> so the, the notes there are good. I, I have all these folders in there, these different folders, and I'll put different notes for the different things that God is sharing in different categories that I'm studying, whether it's different messages or words or leadership and things like that. I'll put them in there. And the reason why I, I kind of like I like the electronic. I sometimes will write, but I lean more towards that. It doesn't matter. No one way is better than the other, to be honest. It's just whatever, whatever way you want to write it down. I like to use the electronic because I'll go to the, to the search bar, and I'll type in pain, hurt, faith, serving. I'll just type in the key word, and all my notes will show up of what I wrote, and I can just go to that word, and I can remember because I wrote down the revelation. So how, do you, how are you, you going to embrace God in the darkness? So we can wrestle to a place of gratitude. How do we embrace? Lean in. Lean in and listen. God is speaking. And then when you hear his voice, you write that down. I don't care where you write it. Write it down, though, so you can own it and you can remember it. And then this last step is the hardest. Wait. Isn't that hard? Isn't that the hardest step of the process of embracing God? Just wait is the hardest thing to do. But I want to give you the secret to waiting well. The secret to waiting well is serving others while you're waiting. See, so many people, they get, look, they get lost wandering in the waiting. And the key to waiting well is to worship while you wait. It's to serve God while you wait. Some people say, oh, man, I'm in a dark period of time. I need to take a season of rest. I need a, I'm in a season of, come on, man. That is not, I don't see that unless you're in the year of Jubilee or something. There ain't no season of rest better get yourself up. Some of you don't know what that is. It's like every seven years, you like take some time off anyway. Get yourself up out of that dark place and worship God while you wait. You don't isolate yourself and you don't stagnate over here. The key to waiting well is to worship while you wait. It's to serve God while you wait. Amen, somebody? That's the key. So what do you do? What do we wait? We wait. We wait. We're waiting for my, will my child ever come back? to the faith, and you're waiting, you're waiting, it's a struggle. Will this relationship ever be restored? Will I ever get that job? Will I ever be able to? You're waiting, you're waiting. Will my spouse admit that they messed up? Will I be able to restore this relationship, this, this marriage? God, will you heal me? Are you going to heal me? Are you going to heal them? And we're waiting, and we're waiting. And back at chapter 2, now verse 3, says, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. Isn't that great news, man, that God actually has an appointment for that revelation for your life, that there is an appointed time. You know that word that you wrote down on the side just a moment ago, whatever that was for you, there is an appointed time for the fulfillment of that in Jesus' name. Amen. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, hey, wait. Though it may not come like you think, it, it, listen, it is worth the wait. Though it linger, wait for it. It certainly will come, and it will not delay. There's, listen, God's timing is perfect, church. It's perfect. I love what the Living Bible translation of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, the way it says it. It says, but these things I plan won't happen right away. We want them to. We want them quick, but that's not how God works. Um, go back, I think. Thank you, sir. Slowly, steadily, surely. The time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems, he says, and now I'm going to the next one. Thank you. If it seems slow, do not despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. Just wait. God's still working. God's still working. Just wait. They will not be overdue a single day. Listen, 
if it's not God's time, you can't force it. If it is God's time, you can't stop it. Just be patient. God is in control and he's on the throne. Remember, God's delays are not God's denials. So, so let me ask you a question. What do, what do we even put in our faith in? Here, let me just, oh, what are you putting your hope in? What is your faith in? Is, is, is it in the circumstances? Is that, is that, is that because of the circumstances? Does that, does that derail you? When circumstances don't go the way you, what, where is your faith and where does it rest? What are you putting it in? Can I give you a declaration that'll change your life? Look, look, that my faith, my faith is not in the results I want. My faith is in the character and goodness of God. See, my faith is not in the circumstances of this life, whether things go my way, go in my time, whether I experience delays, detours, or even darkness. I could be going through the valley of the shadow of death, and I will fear no evil because my faith is not in the valley. My faith isn't even in the mountaintop. My faith isn't in circumstances. My faith is in the goodness and the character of God. That's why I can endure. That's why I can wrestle this thing down to gratitude. No matter what I see, no matter what I feel, I choose faith. No matter how dark this life is, no matter how dark the circumstances or the trials become, I choose to believe. When you don't see a way, God can make a way. When you're losing hope, remember God's promises. If you're hurting or if you're in pain, listen, God is with you and he's for you. God, we declare we will wait for you. We will trust in you even in the darkness. Can I pray for you? Can we bow our heads all across this worship center? Let me pray for you.